okay. Hey everyone, Doug here from 2 Plus Tough, and again, as the snowstorm continues outside in Seattle, I'm doing more of my patron questions, things they send in to me, uh, turning into content that everyone can enjoy. So this one comes from Rad Dude Nelson, and he asks, I have a non-lore related question. What are some tips for someone who is looking to do some conversions or kit bashing? Do you have any helpful tips for working with green stuff or what tools you use to cut and clip stuff up without destroying it? That is a super solid hobby question. Uh, and what I'm gonna do is kind of show off some of the stuff that I've done as far as kit bashes, conversions, uh, things that a lot of it people have already seen, but if you haven't, it'll be a good time to see some of my stuff. Mostly it's my chaos things. I put a lot of work into those, but uh, I'll, I'll go through them and then just kind of give you like an example and talk about some really helpful tips I learned and gleaned while doing them. Before we jump into that though, I wanna clarify that what I mostly do is kit bashing. By that I mean, I take parts from existing model ranges, um, so just other 40K or AOS parts, clip them off the sprue and put them onto uh, another model and kind of change it and kind of incrementally change its appearance that way. We'll get into some tips regarding that, but the first thing I wanna do is show you the tools that I use and they're very, very simple. And here we are at the hobby desk, taking a look at the tools of the trade. Uh, and I keep things very, very simple. You'll see people who do conversions that have tons of stuff, um, special mold line removers and clippers and all that kind of stuff. I just keep it really basic. Set of clippers that I probably need to replace because they're super dull. Yep, that's pretty bad. In addition to that, I have a um, X-Acto knife just to clear off little bits of flash, things like that, as well as plastic glue. Uh, if I'm doing things from a newer GW kit going over, over to another new GW kit, so like um, satchels, things on the hip, weapons, heads, stuff like that, I like plastic glue because it's a nice firm bond. Uh, it doesn't, I don't, I don't have any risk of it breaking or fear of it breaking. If you're doing something with resin, uh, that is actually a different story. You are going to want to uh, use any kind of other glue. I use Gorilla Glue. I like it. It's strong bond. It holds pretty quick uh, and uh, never really had a problem with it. And the other thing here is I don't have any actual green stuff on me right now. I just used it all up. But uh, liquid green stuff is kind of a similar thing in the sense that um, it fills in gaps and uh, it's pretty good for that. You can also, what I like about this is if you're doing Nurgle stuff, and you want to have some texture and rust and make things look gnarly, uh, you can stipple it on with a brush. Uh, always use a brush so you don't mind throwing away and add some texture that way. But it's a great thing for filling in gaps, uh, which is mostly, like I said, what I do. Um, but if it's a really, really big gap, I'll get a, a roll of green stuff and, and jam it in there. And so what I'm gonna do now is kind of clear this stuff off. I wanna show you a bunch of conversions that I've done on my Slaves of Darkness army. And we'll kind of go through them and. Uh, talk about the lessons I learned while doing them uh, and kind of escalate in terms of scale. So the first lesson here I wanna talk about is starting small. What I have here is my Dark Oath War Chieftain. Uh, he is very, very simple. All I did for him was a simple head swap. I cut off the kind of tribal looking head uh, and I even left his hair there in the back. You can see the dead center there and um, put on the head of a Chaos Warrior, whoever the leader of like a general Chaos Warriors troop is, I can't remember what they call him. Um, and then put that on there. Now, the reason I say start small is because your eyes are going to start looking for different things. For example, with him, um, the main thing you're looking at is, does this head fit this body, right? If it's too big, he'll look goofy. He'll look like one of the uh, peanuts, right? The huge round head, tiny little body, or hey Arnold. Uh, if it's too small, he will look like an equally goofy character. Um, and so you wanna make sure everything fits. Uh, and it's not just about heads or body parts. If if the weapon is too small, it, it doesn't look scary in their arms, things like that. So again, start very simple, start very small. I'd say head swaps, weapon swaps, um, anything where you can easily determine scale is probably a better way to start. Moving on from there, I wanna talk about uh, another conversion I did. This one uh, has a little bit more kit bashing in there. This is a Chaos Sorcerer and I changed out the the normal head, and I gave him a pole arm from a dark Eldar, what is it called? Whatever the little like um, troop transport, the tiny one is Venom. And um, I wanted him to character wise be uh, someone who seeks knowledge. And so he has this big book from the Flagellants kit on his front with a bunch of little scribbles on it. And this is a thing from a dark Eldar hero as well. Really this thing, the tip that I wanna show you here is the idea of picking bits and conversion parts that tell a story, right? For him, for the Dark Oath guy, I just wanted a different head. I just didn't like that guy's head, so I changed it. For this sorcerer guy, 
I wanted him to have a story based around someone who seeks out knowledge in forbidden places and things like that. So how do I um, give knowledge, right, or a dark kind of knowledge? Well, uh, for that, obviously the book is a huge thing. The Flagellants Kit, if you're looking for a real tip, is probably the best source of kit bashing parts that GW has ever made. It is an incredible kit. It's the um, Free People's Flagellants Kit. Um, beyond that thing, the book on his front, as far as the skulls stuff like that, I still wanted him to retain a very like primal, like he's searching for dark ancient magic. And so things like the skull on the pyre, um, these kind of archaic accents and stuff like that, I really wanted that to kind of bring out that theme. And so that was kind of the idea there. Now here, there's almost no green stuff whatsoever. It is just straight porting over parts. That's a dark um, plastic glued on the Archon's backpack. The flagellants kit, which has a lot of chains and things like that. You can't quite see it, but the chains go around his neck. And the head is from a Dark Eldar flyer guy. So this is a really, really simple one. It's all just straight parts from one another. But the idea was to try to put these parts together in a way that creates a story for this character. On that theme, we're going to talk about the use of color. So this is another dark, um, or sorry, chaos sorcerer lord that I put together. And it is also uh, just a bunch of kits, pieces put together. And this is the, um, I believe it was a resin sculpt from the, what is it? The Wood Elf line. She used to be like a Wood Elf sorceress type. So I cut off her head, one of her arms, and uh, that was pretty much it. I think as far as cutting stuff off goes. And put on the Dark Eldar witch head, a witch arm. Um, I wanted her to maybe be like a Zinchi wizard. And so she has a bunch of minions doing her work for her evil matriarch type. And so to convey minions and things like that, I had uh, two brimstone horrors at her feet, which you can see there, um, as well as since we're going Zinchi, this is the book that comes off the, the chariot and I put some scribbles in that. So knowledge is a huge theme with my sorcerers. I want them to always be seeking more, getting better. Uh, but yeah, this was one where uh, to demonstrate the use of like resin and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, I had to use um, Gorilla Glue on her to get her to stay still and get all the parts together. I did, you can barely see it, but uh, I did do some green stuff along the back here to do some fur because there was a huge gash in her shoulder where the two arms didn't quite line up. And I thought having a little cowl or something like that going around her back would be really, really cool looking. And so very minimal. I don't do a whole lot of green stuff sculpting. Uh, basically fur is all I do because I don't know how to do any of the rest of it. But it turns out to be pretty, pretty well. So again, this is another one where um, I'm picking parts to convey a core idea. She has minions beneath her that she likes to be in charge and uh, is a seeker of knowledge as well. So again, I, I kind of use those two interchangeably. There's very few times where I have both on the table. People uh, really like this one. This is my Chaos Sorcerer Lord on Manicor. And so um, this is the one, probably the more advanced one where I use a lot of green stuff. And I say a lot, it was just a lot by volume. For this one, if you go pull up the GW site and look up the Manicor model, uh, his head comes out to be right about there. And so what I did was I basically took an X-Acto knife and my pliers and I carved all of that away. When you're doing this kind of stuff, what I really recommend you, oops, sorry, what I really recommend you do is um, just be very, very careful and sense of don't cut yourself obviously. But remember you can always, um, take more of the model off. It's really hard to put it back on. And so uh, it's a lot of trial and error. You know, you'd shave a bunch off, put this skull, which comes from the GW skull kit, like the bunch of 200 skulls in a box, put it on there, see if it fits. No, it doesn't. Okay, and take it off, scrape off a bit more, do it again. Probably try to dry fit about a dozen times or so to make sure I got it quite right. When I did get it quite right, uh, there was still a huge gap right here where the skull meets the main on both sides because it just isn't that big of a piece. And so then I got a bunch of green stuff and jammed it in there and um, used basically like a wet spoon or something like that and tried to like sculpt it just so it made it nice and smooth. And you can see it's a pretty smooth transition uh, for the most part. It's meant to be a dirty skull anyway, so some of it looks perfectly fine. Uh, but with this one, you know, have a vision for what you're doing. And remember when you're scraping things off or, or removing parts of the old model, Always be very conservative in how you do that. You can always, like I said before, take more off. Really hard to put more on. 
and that uh, is pretty much it for that. I didn't do really many conversions besides the head. That's kind of the main thing for this model anyway. When you see it coming at you across the table, like this is what you see, and it's awesome, and I absolutely love him. So Rad Dude Nelson, I hope that was kind of a little bit help, but to recap, because I kind of got a little rambly there, start very small, head swaps, weapon swaps, you're really training your eye to look at scale rather than uh, what you in your head would look or sound really, really cool. Beyond that, it's about picking items that match what you're trying to present. And that's why I did, when I did the videos talking about the realms, like conversion ideas, these are the bits you can look for that would really add this flavor to X model. That's the kind of stuff that I mean, where if you're seeking knowledge, things like books and scrolls are great. If you want them to be um, thieves, like you know, carrying things because you're pickpocketing is also really awesome. So again, um, skulls are an easy one as far as showing that they're fighty and mighty and things like that. So just really understand what you're trying to convey and then think of ways to convey that from other parts of other models. Beyond that, everything is just experimentation. I do, try a few kit bashes, see if what you've created matches the vision you had for it. If it tells the story you want to tell, keep doing it, exploring it more. Otherwise than that, it's a simple matter of just moving parts from one existing kit to another, filling in the gaps and things like that. I'm probably the worst person to ask when it comes to like green stuff, sculpting tips and stuff like that. I don't do any of that. Your tools can be relatively simple, just like the ones I had here. It's how I do all of my model conversions. Just clippers, uh, an X-Acto knife, and uh, something to kind of fill in the gaps, whether that's a real green stuff or liquid green stuff. Pretty much all you need with some adhesive, uh, glue, plastic glue, whatever you want to use. Again, the idea is um, make sure you have a vision for what you're doing, get the parts you need, put it on there, and just experiment. What I would also say at the end here is that uh, less tends to be more. So, for example, with my... Uh, fire lady, I could have done a lot more fire. I could have put five more brimstones on her base um, to really nail home the fact, but I tend to find that the more subtle conversions are the ones that things makes things really stand out, as opposed to if you push a theme too hard, uh, it can be kind of boring, I guess, in a sense, but uh, that's up to you. Like I said, experimentation is the way to go. But again, I just want to thank you for your question and all my patrons over on Patreon who are supporting me and this channel, uh, keeping us running, helping us keep this apartment that is really, really nice, and uh, making sure that I can spend my Fridays making content for the rest of you. So thank you all so much, and I'll see you soon. Happy Wargaming. Hey Wargamers, Doug here, and I know that you've been looking for ways to save money with your hobby. The best way to do this is by magnetizing your miniatures. Buy fewer models, increase the number of options you have in your units. While there are several magnet vendors online, only one of them was specifically tailor-made for wargamers, MagSavvy. MagSavvy magnets have their polarities clearly marked, so you never accidentally end up with that arm repulsing the torso situation that we get sometimes. And it makes magnetizing an entire unit or army a breeze by ensuring that every single weapon works for every single model. You get more, you pay less, and you can get busy gaming, which is what we're here about. So head over to 2 Plus Tough for more details. Currently only available in the US, but coming overseas very soon.